Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. These are the words of the gospel today. It's very interesting that we hear these words coming from Christ to us. It's like he's asking us to do something beyond our abilities. I can't love my enemy, God. I, I cannot do that. I can barely love my family. Right? I, how do you expect me to do that? It's very difficult. I have problems with my parents. I have problems with my kids. I have problems with my friends sometimes. And it's really, life is tough. Life is not easy. So how do you expect me to love my enemies? It's very interesting. But Christ is telling us to love those who hate us. It's not like he's given us a commandment that we cannot follow. He never does this. He always gives us the commandment that we can do. But there is, there is something to this. He continues, and, he, and this, this chapter of, of St. Luke, chapter 6, is very rich that when I started reading it, I realized that each one of the teachings or each one of the verses needs lectures to cover it and give it, cover it in depth or even cover it lightly. He asks us to be merciful. He says, judge not, you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. No one else taught this. No other religion, no other cult, no other culture have taught this, have taught us or have taught humanity to love those who hate them. Love, love your enemy. And then he continues and he says, just as you want men to do to you, also do to them likewise. We call this the golden rule. You want people to treat you nicely, you be nice to them. You want people to treat you kindly, you be kind to them. It is that easy. Sometimes. However, today, I want to answer two questions about this. Why should I love my enemy? And then the second question is, after we establish the why, definitely we will ask, how can we love our enemies? Why do we have to love our enemies? Because Christ asked us to do so. That's number one. He wants us to love our enemies. Number two, he says, your reward will be great. If you do this, if you love your enemies, your reward in heaven will be great. Actually, it's in heaven will be great, and on earth it will be great as well. How? Those who don't know how to love and have negative feelings in their hearts, they cannot live in peace. They don't know how to live in peace. Those who don't know how to forgive, they don't know how to live in peace. When we go talk about problems to our friends, when we vent about our own problems to our friends, we want to hear some comforting words that tells us you are right and they're wrong, 
right? We want to hear that first. We want to have the, the, the friend's approval about the problem that we're complaining about. But the friend's approval does not really help much because I'm still, I still feel that the problem is there. Yes, it's good to have the approval, but the problem is not solved. And if I let the emotions eat me from the inside, and I let that hatred or negativity or selfishness build in inside, there is no peace. Those who know how to forgive, they know and they live in peace. Those who learn how to forgive, they live in peace. Your reward on earth will be great. And in heaven, there will be a crown. There will be a crown for us. Christ asked us to love our enemies and he will reward us here on earth and in heaven if we do so. And the third point, if you love your enemy, you will be called the children of the Most High. You will be known that you are the children of God. This is what distinguishes you from any other person in the world. You are the children of the Lord. Because no other culture or religion teaches that. Those who um, all about human rights and all about um, logic and all about um, material things, and it's very rare when you hear God in their words. It's very rare when they mention God. And it's interesting enough that they sometimes they take it to a totally different level when they start to ignore God's presence completely and there is no God. It's, it's very interesting that God who gave them the sound mind to be who they are, to be that intelligent, they flip on him and they don't acknowledge his presence. Every atheist and everyone who deny the presence of the Lord, the Lord himself is the one who gave him that mind that now he's using it against the Lord. Not just his, his personal thing, you know, but sometimes they go out and preach about the wrong beliefs. But back to our point, if we love our enemies, we will be called the children of the Most High. We will be called sons of God. Daughters of God. We were here yesterday in the girls' camp, um, and the girls were singing Sons of God. You remember this hymn? We used to sing it after, uh, during communion. I don't know what happened to it. We don't hear it anymore. But maybe because um, all the occasions that were happening, the Lent and uh, Holy Fifties and all the associated hymns that comes with during communion. But yes. This is what distinguishes you from others, that you are the children of God, if you love your enemies. If this is the how, I'm sorry, if this is the why, why should I love my enemy? Then how can I do that? The question is, how can I love my enemy? So I'm going to have to cover how and what is the definition of love. And who is my enemy? So how can I love my enemy? First of all, who is your enemy? Who is your enemy? When you hear the word enemy, who comes to your mind? That's a question for you. And then when you have that, that face that comes to your mind, ask yourself, is that a real enemy? Is that, is that my real enemy? And then after you answer to yourself, then ask yourself this question. Do I, is, is he a real enemy or he's just an enemy because I chose to call him my enemy? Or in a better way or in a different way to put it, um, do, we, um, do we call everyone that we disagree with my enemy? Do we call everyone that we have constant conflict with an enemy? Or no? If we do, then that's a wrong label, I'm sorry. It, this is not your enemy. Maybe a conflict, maybe disagreement, 
maybe negative emotions, whatever it is, but not an enemy. But then if you, if you answer yes to all these questions and still the answer is yes, this is my enemy, then okay, this is your enemy. Now what do we do? How can I love this person who is my enemy? Love is not a noun, love is a verb. When you love, you do something. That's what love is. When you love, you have to do something. You don't show love just by words. You show love by actions. All right? And today, the message is to be merciful. So show kindness. You want to love someone who hates you? Be kind to them. Be merciful to them. Love is not just emotions. Uh, I feel bad for him. I feel sympathy for him. That's very limited range of love. No, love is an action. You see him in need, you jump in and you help him. This is how you kill your enemy, by switching him to a friend. I'll give you two examples. Uh, regarding the point, if we have the right to be mad at someone or, um, or to call them an enemy. Um, when, we, uh, when Cain um, offered a sacrifice to God, and Abel offered a sacrifice to God, Cain's offering were rejected, but Abel's, Abel's were accepted, okay? And what happened to Cain? What happened to him? He was so angry, right? He was so angry and he was so mad. And God asked him a very important question that we need to ask ourselves when we are mad at someone. Why have your countenance fell down? Why are you mad? Do you have the right to be mad? And here is the worst answer that we can get. Yes, I have the right to be mad. Well, let me tell you something. You have the right to be a lot of things, okay? This is a country of free rights, right? But this is not what I mean when I ask you, do you have the right to be mad? Is it truthfully, are you mad in truth? Are you being a good and honest judge on yourself and on the situation to be mad at this moment? Did you evaluate the situation correctly and then you're still mad or no? Or you just let your emotions blind you that you're mad at someone? This is what it means when I ask someone, when we ask someone, are you rightfully mad at this person? Do you have the right to be mad at them? Do you have the right means that is, is truth on your side? or are being biased by your love to your own ego? That's a very important question to ask. Because sometimes we are at fault. We are the bad guys, not the, front, the person in front of me. Sometimes we are the predators. We are the one who needs a little bit of disciplining, not the other person. But we chose to call them enemies because of a conflict of interest. Another example that the Lord asked Jonah when Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and he told them after 40 days the city will be destroyed. And he didn't say anything more than this. And he left. What happened after this is people repented. That's why we fast three days before the Lent to prepare us for the Lent. People repented and God forgave them. And Jonah, what happened to Jonah? He was so mad again, like Jonah was mad. Why are you mad, Jonah? But God asked him the question in a different way. He asked him, is it right for you to be angry? Ask yourself this question when you're mad at someone. Is it right for me? Is it, is the truth on my side when I'm mad at, one, at someone? Is the truth on my side or is it I just want to be mad at them because this is the easy way to fix things, you know? Because they're wrong and I'm right. This is the easy way. This is always the easy way. And I'm talking especially to the younger ones who are here today. This is not the right way to fix things. A wise person who always evaluate the situation more than once, think it through. Don't lash back. Don't answer without thinking. Always let his mind analyze the situation. That's what God was telling Jonah. Is it right 
for you to be angry. Ask yourself this in any situation that you're mad at someone. And then, if this is the definition of an enemy that we covered, and then the definition of love, and then we have to, now we need to answer the how. How can I love my enemy? This is beyond our abilities as human to do. We are not wired in a way that there is a button that we can push, then we can love our enemies. We're not wired like that. This is beyond our, it's above our abilities to do. Once you realize this, it is above your ability to do, and you still want to do it, the next logical thing to do is to bow your head, submit to the Lord, and ask for His grace to elevate you to that level, because you cannot do it on your own. You know, the little ones when try to reach uh, something over the counter, and they try and try and try, and they, they realize, I cannot reach that. I need a little help. What do they do? They go to their parents and they raise their hand and then they start to point at, at what they want. This is us. When we realize that this is above our human ability to do, we bow our heads before Christ and we tell Him, I need grace, I need strength from you to love my enemy because I cannot do this on my own. It's really hard. As we established earlier, sometimes it's, sometimes it's hard to, live, to love the people who live in the same household. You know, and we pray for that too. So if we are praying for God to help us, give us grace, to love our enemies, then for, by all means we should pray also for Him to help us to love our family. There are a few benefits for the enemies in our lives. I will mention just three of them, and then we're done. Uh, Saint, uh, Saint Nikolai Flamerovich, he is a Serbian Orthodox bishop who was born in late 1800s, probably 1880 or something. And then he was taken as a captive or as a, a, war, um, yeah, a war captive in the Second World, uh, Second World War. And then he was put in a concentration camp. And when, while he was in the concentration camps, he was praying for those who captured him. And this is what he said about his enemies at them. He said, enemies judged me when I justified myself. Enemies judged me when I justified myself. When I was righteous in front of my own eyes, enemies put me under the spot and they judged me. I needed that. Enemies confessed my sins in front of the whole world when I tried to hide them. They helped him to be pure. They helped him to be cleansed. And we're talking about a bishop as a war captive. It's interesting how he looks at a very negative situation and take a positive out of it. He said, my enemies push me near the Lord than my friends did. When people inflict pains and torture and, and torment on us, they make us get close to the Lord because we are praying about the problems that's happening around us. That what, that's what enemies do to us. The benefits of the enemy, they actually get us closer to the God because of the hard situation they brought us in. And then we'll conclude with this. He says, one hates his enemies only when he fails to realize that they're not enemies, they're just cruel friends. One hates his enemies only when he fails to realize they are not enemies, but cruel friends. That coworker with you who's given you a hard time all the time at work, he, he, maybe God is telling you you need to improve a little bit. You need to be a better version of yourself. That one person, that annoying little sister at home or annoying little brother who is causing you trouble all the time, he's just telling you to grow up, you know? Be a step up and be an older brother or sister. It's really, it's not really your enemy, you know? Not enemy, just a friend, a cruel friend that tells the truth without sugarcoating. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you. 
Lord, please help us to love our enemies and to bless those who curse us. To yours is glory and forever and ever. Amen.